All right, and we are live. Awesome. Today I have Anne with me. Anne, how are you? <laughs> I'm great, thanks. How are you doing? I am well. I'm well. Um, I usually try and like think of when the first time I met uh, the person. So I'm trying to think when you and I first met. It's been so uh, I remember. You remember. Oh, you it, do. Okay. I do remember. Yeah. So it was 2013. Um, I at that point was working at a charity and was in the process of launching a Bitcoin donation program and had called like a couple of people in the space. I think I got connected. Can't remember who it was through, but I, I got connected to uh, Joseph and invited him for coffee and he brought you. And so the three of us just like <laughs> shot the shit. We're talking about Bitcoin at a Mercado on Toronto street. And uh, that was the beginning. It was still like such early days. And then I was- uh, What year was did you say? 20... 2013. 2013. Oh, okay. 2014. Yeah. Late 2013, All right. early 2014. Cause I know our program launched in yeah, like May, I think of 2014, but I had started mm. it the previous year. Um, so it was early days anyway. Interesting. So uh, let's maybe start with, uh, you know, I, I call Bitcoin like the, the, the tech, well, it's like the, the financial singularity of sorts. But before, you know, you discovered Bitcoin, um, curious, like what, uh, what's, what's your, your backstory? Like where are you coming from? What's your lens into the world? Yeah, so I, I always call it my pre-blockchain career. Um, it was actually in humanitarian aid. So I uh, graduated from my MBA and went to work with Doctors Without Borders, which is an international medical organization. Um, they go into you know, about 100, how many countries? 70 countries around the world with different medical projects. Um, and so the first job that I ever had leaving school was working in Central African Republic in a pediatric malnutrition emergency program. Um, so I moved to a place where, you know, it was this tiny village in the middle of nowhere, thatched huts, you know, no water, no electricity. Um, so it was really quite an incredible experience from a variety of perspectives. You know, first and foremost, it was it was about learning how to adapt and learning um, how to solve problems in a place where you have access to nothing, you know, where the nearest uh, shop to get things that you need was two or three hours away. And anything you needed that was complex or had to come from Europe, you know, you're looking at three weeks to three months. So I can remember one time, you know, our generator broke, we didn't have lights for the hospital mm. and we had to figure out what we were going to do about that. Cause we had, you know, again, like a three week time frame to get the, the part in. And so we ended up driving the car around, taking the battery out, connecting the battery to the generator system, and then doing that again when the battery ran out. So it was really just this, this whole process of, learning how to do things um, when you're resource constrained. Um, but the biggest thing I think that I learned from that whole experience um, was just about how inefficient money was because, because we were in the middle of nowhere, everything was cash. At this point, it was 2010, mobile money was like existed in Kenya and Pesa had started, but it wasn't pervasive by any means. Um, and so we had 200 staff members that we had to pay in person in cash twice a month. And that was my job. And so part of my role was to carry knapsacks full of cash through jungles, military checkpoints, rivers. Okay. Like, there's a picture of me in a dugout canoe with like a knapsack with like $7,000 on my back, you know, and you can imagine how far $7,000 goes in Central African Republic. I mean, it's, it's like a multi-generational fortune. Um, and so, you know, I look back on that time now, I was 25 years old, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I didn't die. I really don't know how I didn't die. Um, and so that for me was, was really a bit eye opening. I mean, I, I didn't expect that wasn't what I expected going, you know, on a mission for medical humanitarian aid was to sit there like moving money, manually counting bills. Um, and, you know, having people show up and put their fingerprint on their pay stub to, to show that they'd received it. Um, but the cash was actually a huge problem beyond just the like administration of it. I mean, it was unsafe for our staff. We had to change the day we paid salaries out so that we didn't create a pattern where someone would know, okay, it's payday at Doctors Without Borders. Let's go in and, and ransack um, the, uh, the compound. Um, and so it was, it was really a bit of an education in how outdated our money systems were. And so for me, when I learned about Bitcoin in 2012, the first thing I thought about was, was that, you know, like imagine if 
from Europe, we could just click a, a, you know, a mouse and Bitcoin would get transferred into the cell phones of all of our staff worldwide. I mean, just the efficiency of it alone, um, but then the safety that that would create for you know, both the international staff that was carrying this money, but then also the, the national staff that would you know, have to have to pick it up in cash. Um, and so it, it really, for me, was a transformative uh, moment learning about Bitcoin and realizing that you know, this, this currency had implications that were so much broader than I think even the people who'd created it or the people who are you know, in the early community um, had thought about. Mm. Cool. So that is uh, that's a pretty interesting story. I didn't realize that. Uh, I, I knew you were with Doctors with Borders, but I didn't realize it was. Uh, yeah, that that sounds pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. So 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 moving forward. So the, and that's like around what year time? Year uh, you said prior to twenty twelve? Yeah. So I started with them in twenty ten, um, mm. and then worked with them in a couple of jobs, more on the fundraising and marketing side. Uh, for a couple of years and then worked for Dignitas International, which was an HIV AIDS organization. And that's where I started um, one of the world's first Bitcoin donation programs. We certainly weren't the first, but we were one of. Um, and at that time, yeah, this would have been 2014 when it launched. And I can remember like the time when I wanted to start the program, I think Bitcoin was at like maybe $240 or something. And I had to convince my CEO that this was a good idea. And she was someone who was like afraid to use her credit card online. So I knew this was gonna be a bit of a tricky endeavor. Um, but in the end, I just convinced her. I'm like, look, we'll accept it, we'll sell it. It's just like a stock. And she said, okay, I think just out of probably ignorance of, of what the, the, the system itself looked like and that kind of thing. Um, and we made about, at the time would have been like $1,000 worth of Bitcoin. Um, by the time we launched the program, Bitcoin had dropped by half. It was like 130 or something like that, uh, um, if I recall correctly. And so no one was donating at that point, you know, it was everyone was holding on to their money. And uh, my, my predictions of Bitcoin at that point were not being validated. Um, but it was, uh, it was really that program that kind of launched me into the Bitcoin community, because at that point I started to look, okay, I need to go and find some donors that are interested in giving. And so I actually got connected. First person I ever met um, was Gerald Cotton. Uh, I had reached out to him to, to say like, hey, maybe Quadriga wants to donate, um, whatever. And so we met up for coffee and he introduced me to the meetups uh, on Spadina Avenue. And so that was really the the introduction to getting to know everyone and i i distinctly remember at that point in time i was pretty um brain dead working in charity fundraising knew i didn't want to do it but didn't know what else i wanted to do and when i showed up to that first meeting it was like a wednesday night um met some of you know the great players in the toronto scene michael perklin josh ethan like that whole crew and I just, you know, by Thursday morning, I was like, is it Wednesday again? You know, I'm so excited. I can't wait for the next meetup. And that for me was really, I knew, um, you know, I knew there was so much that I didn't know and understand about the technology at that point, but I knew I was a part of something that was just absolutely massively transformative um, and wanted to, you know, play a bigger role. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, whenever people ask me about my story, I always bring up meetups as well. And I always try and tell people like, there's something really magical about meetups Like you get random people that don't know one another getting together on a Friday night. Um, yeah, those are people you want to hang around. Like those are people you want to build businesses with and do fun things with because like you're passionate about the, about the same thing. And it's got nothing to do with making money. It's got everything to do with like, you know, trying to change the world or I mean, maybe it's got to do with both, but, but okay. Um, so from there, what happened? So Gerald Cotton. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. What a, what an intro. Okay. <laughs> I know. I, I did not see, I did not predict uh, the, the outro of that story, but. The uh, outro. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, from there. So then um, I, I had kind of a, a, I don't know what you would call it, like a do or die moment in 2015 where I knew I wanted to get into crypto, but at that point in time, as like a non-coder, there weren't, there weren't a ton of jobs around. It was, it was still very early days. And uh, I got offered a really huge promotion in the fundraising world. I would have been, you know, 28, raising $60 million with a team of 15 people. Um, 
and I just couldn't get excited about it. Uh, and I had to make this really tough decision of, do you take this actual real amazing job in a field that you're like not that excited about anymore? Or do you hold out, say no, and look for something in blockchain, which you know at this point I was really excited about. Um, and I ended up turning it down. And it took me a year to actually find a job in blockchain. So it was not the smoothest transition, but uh, I started working at Decentral for about three months and then moved over to Ledger Labs. Uh, there was, a, I think, a crew of about five of us, um, including Vitalik that had started this company and uh, doing consulting through them. Um, and that lasted about three months because at that point I got accepted to Singularity University, which was kind of another very exciting turning point in my life. So um, if you're not aware, Singularity is a kind of innovation hub meets think tank meets education center. And their goal is really to teach people about exponential technologies. So technologies like AI, VR, nanotech, biohacking, all that sort of thing. Um, and how you apply those to problems around the world that impact more than a billion people. Mm. And the concept is that, you know, when we look to try and solve problems around the world, we typically go at it with a 10% mindset where every year we make the problem 10% better than it was the year before. Mm. Um, and they say, you know, it's not good enough. 10% is not good enough to stop climate change or to, you know, get clean water to everyone or, you know, problems of that sort of nature. And it was really about making the shift of your mindset from 10% to 10x. So how do you make this problem 10 times better? And a really good example of, of how that type of thinking kind of works is like, if I said to you, um, if you could make the room you're sitting in better, how would you do it? And most people would say, well, I'd make my chair more comfortable or there'd be more natural light or the temperature would be warmer. Um, if I said, how would you make your room around you 10 times better? You say, oh my gosh, I, there'd be like a hologram of my best friend beside me and we could hang out or, or the room would be inside a helicopter and I could fly it to Hawaii and back as we're doing the meeting. Um, and the reality is the type of thinking that you use to solve problems at that scale is completely different than the type of thinking that we use on a daily basis. And so their goal is to bring entrepreneurs, educators, innovators from all across the globe together to start companies that use technology for social impact. Um, and so I actually ended up starting a company in the legal blockchain sector. So looking at the concept that like today's legal system is super inaccessible unless you have money to pay for a lawyer or, you know, you could read legalese, which is pretty much no one. Um, and I just figured when the legal system was based on smart contracts, that problem was going to be exacerbated. And so we wanted to create a system where you could take natural language programming and have it auto convert into smart contracts. So making it really easy, like a legal Zoom for smart contracts, essentially. Um, you fill in a little form, automate, automates the code. And so this was 2016. Um, so we were down at NASA campus working on this, a friend of mine who was a, a lawyer out of Italy. And um, we were so excited. It was just like, we thought this was the greatest idea ever. We started taking it to legal firms and saying, hey, like this is what we're working on. And we're like, okay, so you know smart contracts. And they'd be like, no, what's a smart contract? I'm like, oh, well, you know blockchain, right? And they're like, no, what's blockchain? And I said, well, have you heard of Bitcoin? They're like, oh, that thing, I saw a headline. What, what is it? And we just realized that like the product, we were never gonna be able to turn this into a viable company in the short term because we were just way too soon. It was, um, you know, uh, probably, eight to 10 years too soon for any type of product that you could actually bring to the legal market. And so we ended up shutting the company down, unfortunately, but I still think it's a good idea. In fact, I was at an incubator um, probably a year ago now, and someone pitched basically the same concept on stage that they were working at it. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I got this. Like I started this company. I know what, where you're gonna hit your pitfalls. I know what the struggles are gonna be. Like great idea, good thinking. You need to pause this for at least another couple of years. Um, so it was pretty funny. So started that company. Um, oh, and I had a company before that actually in um, remittances from the Canadian to Philippine corridor. This was like 2015. I was working on that while I was still working full time. But yeah, I shut that down for kind of the same reason, just that the market wasn't ready. You know, you'd go talk to all these people and they just, it was too much of an education gap to get them to use it. Um, and so when I finished up at Singularity, I ended up um, running an impact investment platform on blockchain out of South Africa. So I moved to Cape Town 
um, for about eight months. And this was during like the 2017 crypto ICO boom where everything was going really well. And like we were looking at doing our own ICO and trying to time the market around like how ready were we as a company to actually do this versus like how are the regulations going to change in Switzerland, you know, between when we want to start and when we actually launch and all this sort of thing. Um, and in the end, we got nailed by timing where we didn't launch fast enough and the regulations changed in Switzerland such that you couldn't launch an ICO unless you had a working platform, which we didn't. So, um, hey, hey Anne, yeah. um, I was going to ask you something. So first of all, did you ever meet Raymond Kurzweil? Yeah, yeah. You did? Yeah, we, oh, I'm such met. a big fan. Yeah. I'm like, I, I would have a poster of him if my wife... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't married. Yeah, for sure. He's super cool. I've read all his books. Um, so you met him, eh? Uh, I actually yeah, met... Yeah, him and Peter Diamandis. I met Peter. Uh, I met Peter school. Diamandis. Yeah. yeah, but never Ray Kurzweil. And he I mean, he wrote the book called um, The Singularity is Near, right? That was yeah, like and he's got another book ago. coming out now. Um, Does? I can't remember what the heck it's called. It's like the singularity is nearer or something. It's sort of a sure. Okay. I, I would say I would fitting, say a ten percent <laughs> increase on his previous book. <laughs> um, that's a good one. But yeah, no, I was just curious to know. So okay, so a couple a couple of things. So um, very interesting. So Doctors Without Borders. Um, you know, you kind of uh, there's like a lot of things, right? But but you get into Bitcoin uh, through Gerald Cotton. Funny enough, you uh, you work with Vitalik, right? Like uh, the founder of Ethereum at Ledger Labs. We kind of just fast forwarded through that one, but that's pretty epic. Um, you get to what teach or what were you doing at Singularity University exactly? So at the time I was a student, so mm. we, yeah, we were at NASA campus in Silicon Valley and then they had, you know, um, the, the greatest experts in everything come it, through it, and teach us. So like it's, Ralph it's on my bucket taught list. us about It's nanotech. on my bucket list. Before I oh, die, yeah. I want to go through that. So uh, I'm you, envious. You definitely should. So <laughs> I actually teach there now. I'm faculty nice. with Singularity now. And so I go around the Boss. world and essentially, yeah, teach people about, you know, the, the greater potential of technology. So for me, it's about blockchain, but my perspective is very much about what's the greater good that blockchain brings. So most of the people that come through our programs come with this stigma around Bitcoin and blockchain. That's like, oh, again, you know, this is what we've always heard. It's about drugs. It's about, you know, uh, trafficking. It's all these negatives um, mm. about, about the technology. And I say, okay, you know, let's look at decentralized ID for you, you know, maybe it doesn't actually add that much value, but for a woman in Saudi Arabia, who's trying to flee her abusive family, having decentralized ID is really important. Or you look at, um, you know, inflation, for example, which is a very basic example, you know, in Canada, where we are, inflation is not a huge issue. It's not something where people are, are crying out loud for support, but you go to Argentina, it's a huge issue. You know, you go to Venezuela and it's not just a financial issue. It's actually a humanitarian issue because people are starving because they can no longer afford food. And when you take that type of lens on it and you take people out of their own shoes and into the shoes of someone in, in a place where, you know, government systems might not work that well or the financial system isn't as stable and they can actually start to understand why this is so important. So pieces around free speech and turning off internet. Uh, you know, if you're again in Toronto, it's like not such a big deal. If you're turning off the internet in Sudan where they're, you know, murdering people in the streets and you need to talk to the BBC, that's a big problem. So like a mm. blockchain based mesh network in Sudan, very important in Canada, eh, less so. Um, and so it's really about helping people understand, yeah, what are the broader potential applications for the technology? But then also thinking again, like we're at this really interesting point in society where you can see with what's happening in the United States and in a bunch of other countries, these systems that we've built up over time, these institutions are falling apart. They're crumbling because they weren't designed for today's society and they just mm. don't work. Um, and so we have this opportunity to really redesign society from the ground up. And what would that look like if you had the opportunity to completely design, you know, your, your city state, your structure uh, that you use for governance right from, from the ground up, what would it look like? And, and that gets people to really think about, okay, what, what's working, what's not, you know, why is government centralized or why are countries centralized around government? Why are they not centralized around uh, the individual as, you know, that piece creating this whole decentralized network of, of citizens that work together and, and interact together? 
Um, and so I think for me, singularity is it's about understanding applications for social good, but also breaking apart everything that you know as a person that's that's stable around your life and saying, hey, like this could be so much better. What are you doing to make that happen? Hey, and I got to ask you a question. So I, I believe one of the most like contrarian and exciting things about the singularity idea is this concept of stopping and then eventually reversing the aging cycle. Yes. Do you buy into this or are you like, hell no, it's never happening? I 100% think it's happening. It'll happen. Mm. The, the question is really- Will it happen in our lifetime? I think it will happen in our lifetime, but not for us. Mm. for the next generations that come. So Wait, probably that, not your, so it'll not happen in our lifetime, but not for us. What does that mean? So like it, you know, it you're comes, not then... going to be able to live forever and your daughters aren't going to be able to live forever, but oh. their children might. And so, you know, Wait, there but, will... but according to Raymond's uh, timeline, it's 2040, which yes, means that it would come in. But I don't lifetime. think it's going to be as applicable <laughs> <laughs> older people. That's where that's where I think it, it makes a difference. You know, so you can look at there's like CRISPR Cas9, you can do gene editing already, but you can't really gene edit, you know, the Alzheimer's gene out of an 80 year old. It doesn't work the same way as it would if you're editing it out of a, a newborn baby, that type of thing, you know, and I think that's where and, and there was some study. I don't know. I don't even know. I should probably be more. Um, I wish I had like a Jamie. Jamie, pull it up. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but no, uh, I need someone to help me. But no, I, I was going to say I recently read, though, that there was like it was like a really small sample size, but they ran some sort of. I don't know, laboratory test, uh, and, and they came out the other side saying that they reversed the aging. I don't know. Anyways, anyways okay, I digress. Back to your story. So where, where were we? Um, where <laughs> well, were we, we? We were trying to become younger. No, I, I, uh, I think, I mean, to go back to that, I think that's going to happen. We will see it. Love it. It will happen. And then there's going to be all these interesting ethical considerations around, you know, what happens in that generation between the last people who die and then what does society look like when you've got a whole group of people that live forever? Um, Mars? Mars, you know, like <laughs> man hours when you don't need man hours anymore because everything's done by AI. Um, it'll, be, it'll be really interesting. Okay, we're, we're, okay I want to come back to a bunch of these topics afterwards, <laughs> okay. but I want to make sure I get your, your, your kind of your storyline here. So what, yeah, what's, what, sure. what comes next? What comes next? Okay, so... Yeah, so I ended up coming back to Canada and and really kind of seeing that after I'd done these these three startups and that you know the timing on a lot of them just it was way too soon that um, I realized there was an education gap that you know you could push and push and push with all these innovations coming out of Bitcoin and blockchain which were so incredible but if the world wasn't ready to receive them and ready to implement them you weren't going to get anywhere and so I very much shifted my focus away from building and over to educating. And so spent a lot more time with Singularity doing you know, presentations, workshops, trainings, and then have focused on um, the education of the next generation. And so right now my like most exciting project that I love is uh, a graphic novel that I'm working on that teaches kids about blockchain. Um, so I've partnered with uh, an artist out of Nairobi, Kenya named Chief Niamwea, who's just extraordinarily talented. And the goal is just to create a really exciting story that features, you know, a young African woman, she's going through the world and her community is broken. There's all these issues with it. And she learns about blockchain and then creates this incredible new community um, that all of her friends and family are a part of. And so it really it's about um, how do you teach kids and inspire kids about this technology in a way that makes them want to become developers, crypto owners, entrepreneurs. Um, because they're really the, the generation that we need to be looking at. It's not so much about, you know, trying to get 50 year old stockbrokers to love this tech. It's about, you know, who's that 15 year old kid that needs to decide on his life path soon uh, and could choose to, um, you know, I don't know, go work in government or could choose to become a developer. And, and that's who we're, we're really going after. And so we have um, a huge goal. We want to reach over a million kids on the African continent with this book. And so we're giving it away for free. So the digital version will be open access, mobile first. Um, and we're actually putting together an animated motion comic that'll be about 45 minutes. Uh, it'll be of the story. We'll push it out on Instagram um, and hopefully through some African TV networks. So 
that's uh that's my my biggest passion at the moment is is getting wow. that next generation on board cool well i i gotta well i was gonna say two but now it's a three-year-old and a five-year-old at home and i'm i'm, I'm brainwashing them every day <laughs> <laughs> No, we do. no, no, I'm kidding. But yeah, we no, but they're they're definitely. I mean, I'm just so genuinely interested and excited. I, you probably remember some of the events I used to do here in Toronto. I used to I bring do, them up on yeah. stage and stuff, and so they've yeah. kind of grown up around around the Bitcoin scene, and hopefully they'll take to it. Uh, right now, Mia's kind of focused on her schoolwork, which. <laughs> Um, okay. So, so, wow. I didn't know that you're working on this. That's, that's super fascinating. That's, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think, um, so I was going to say a couple of things. So one thing is that one, the kind of common denominator I'm noticing is that a, a lot of people that like got early into Bitcoin tend to have a, like a bit of a global perspective, you know, like mm-hmm. they have traveled a bit or they've seen other parts of the world and, and it kind of took a little bit of that experience for them to really appreciate um, Bitcoin. Another thread, or I mean, I guess common denominator I've noticed is that you'd be surprised how many 50 year olds were educated by their kid. Yeah. So I was just interviewing Crypto Victor. Came out, you know. Yeah, he's in Bitcoin. He's working for like this awesome, you know, company and all that. And it's like, well, when you find out, well, how did you get into it? I got two twins, you know, 22 year old sons that got me into it, you know, five years ago or whatever. So it's always the kids. So yeah, definitely don't, don't, don't overlook the children. So a million, I also recently actually went live with an interview with, uh, do you know, Paxful? Have you heard of Ray? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I interviewed them. They they actually built um, a couple schools in Africa as well, and, and that's part of their 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 mission as well. Um, in Africa, Bit Pesa is that the the one that it's Elizabeth, right? That, Elizabeth that Rossiello, that. yeah. She's yeah. been just an absolute forerunner in this space. Like Bit Pesa started in 2013. I've been following their progress like from day one. She's a she beast. She is a powerhouse. <laughs> um, and I, I really <laughs> think yeah. it's, yeah, in an absolute positive way. Like mm-hmm. they've done so much for this space. They've pivoted a number of times in, in really smart ways. Um, and I, I think she, more than many others in, in you know, this industry, uh, really saw the value and the potential in developing markets right off the bat. You know, a lot of people were trying to get Americans to send money to other Americans. And it's like, no, 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 look, like Africa is light years ahead of everywhere else in the world in terms of mobile payments. So for them to upgrade to crypto is like easy peasy. Um, and they have massive needs to be sending money. It's, it was just a really smart play right from the beginning. And, and they've done really, really well with it. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, if at one point you want to make like an Indian author collabo with the children's book in India, that might be something we, we could work on as like a phase two. That'd be fun. Lots of kids I mean, in India. We're open to it for <laughs> sure. I mean, the, the bigger the bigger hope for the this project is that, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll work with different artists from all around the world um, who share kind of a similar story, but that's like culturally relevant to where they are. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, one of the stories or one of the storylines that's going to be in the book is about how the main character gets, you know, pulled over and, and shook down by the cops. And that story comes from the author's life. It comes from Chief's own life. It's things that mm. happen to him and, and you know, stories that mm. he sees in the headlines are things that he's weaving through this story. So it's very relevant for, you know, kids that that they look around their world and say, oh, this happened to my aunt, this happened to my, my dad. Um, mm. I can fix this myself by getting involved in this space. Yeah, yeah, cool. Very, very inspirational. Um, okay. So, so that actually, that does cover my first two questions. So (laughs) which are, which is your, your backstory, I guess you're kind of segueing into your current project. Um, and and is any, before I move on to the next question, any, any other things you want to mention or highlight on, on the current project? Any, I mean, sounds super exciting. Definitely have my support. Let me know, like, uh, if there's any way we can help, but yeah, I mean, we've had incredible support from across the entire blockchain industry. Like we've gotten grants from Interchain Foundation, uh, consensus grants from Conflux Network, Algorand, Cardano, like people are really coming together from, from all across the space to support this. And mm. so we're, yeah, we're going to, we're in Gitcoin grants round eight, uh, launches soon. So if anyone wants to support the project, they can do it there. And, 
The other person that came to my mind as you were speaking was Connie. Have you have you ever worked with Big Give? Yes. You know Connie. Yeah, Connie mm-hmm. actually has been interviewed for another book that I that is I wrote that's coming out in January. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very niche, but I think still an important book. It's a guide essentially for charity fundraisers and how to establish cryptocurrency donation programs. Um, mm. And so we interview both, you know, crypto donors, people who set up their own programs successfully. And then, of course, Connie, who was really, you know, again, at the forefront of, of that space way, way back in the day. Love um, her work. So, yeah. 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 So I, I'm going to hopefully have her on the on on this uh, soon. Oh, nice. yeah. But uh Okay, cool. So, okay, let's, let's, I guess let's get into uh, some deeper waters here. <laughs> so, um, so you have a pretty interesting, I guess you could say lens into this space. Um, you know, you travel quite a bit. Just curious, what, what is one um, like truth that you hold to be, you know, true that most others in this blockchain space would, you know, maybe disagree with you on or Bitcoiners <laughs> would disagree with you on? Uh, I think I have two. Um mm. I, the, and the first one is that uh, it, it's a, a view that I would say many Ethereum community people hold, but Bitcoin not so much, and that's that diversity matters. Um, I, I see a lot of that kind of closed libertarian mindset around, you know, well, if you want to get into Bitcoin, do it yourself. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what color your skin is or, or what your gender is or anything like that. you like, if you want to be a part of it, do it. But on the flip side, you know, uh, Oh, if you're building the financial infrastructure and, you know, the backbone of pretty much everything for the future, and you've only got white men that are building it, that's a problem. It's a huge problem. Um, And so I really applaud the initiatives uh, more in the Ethereum community that are looking to get more people of color, more women involved, looking at, you know, what are the barriers to to having people join in um, and try to break those down. And I I think Ethereum and some of the other, you know, incredible blockchains that are out there that are doing similar work are probably going to prevail in a bigger way because they are including everyone, you know, and I I think to, to just have very closed teams that look a lot like you are not, it's not a way to, to create something that works for the entire world. Um, And Mm. so I hope, I hope there will be some growth in mindset around that. Um, I, I, I'm actually interested, you know, because like you, you mentioned, you you were kind of, not kind of you were in in the the space back when Ethereum was probably just an idea still, right? Yep. Um. So you, you know, um, that, that Ethereum has a lot of like hardcore uh, diehard fans, but then it also has a, a whole crew of people, especially within Bitcoin, that despise it. Um, but curious to know, like what, I mean, you probably, I think you said you discovered Bitcoin first, but then you have this affinity towards Ethereum as well. Just curious what, what, what that kind of like, what that process looked like for you. And, and, you know, like, um, in addition to kind of the diversity element, like what was it like technologically? Was it just the community where like, what was it about it that, that attracted you to it? Part of it was certainly the community. Um, I think a lot of it was, I mean, look, I still love Bitcoin. I think it's great. I think it's, it's going to do wonderful things, but it's vision stops at money usually with most people, you know, where they don't, they don't care about some of the broader, you know, applications that you can get through Ethereum, uh, identity, governance, et cetera, et cetera. Like it, for them, it's really just, well, if, if I have control of my money, then the world will be okay. And it's just not, it's just not accurate. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a great improvement. It's going to help a lot of people. But if you really want to create larger structural change in the world, then you you really need to be looking at some of the other systems that our society is built upon and how you can break those apart and rebuild them. And so for me, the vision around Ethereum still held a lot of the beliefs that Bitcoin had, but took them that much further. And, and we're looking at a much broader set of use cases and examples um, to achieve them. And I, I think it's also a bit about what's the culture of the, the people who are building on, on both of those. And with Bitcoin, I find there's a lot of hate. I find there's a lot of um, trying to put other people down, trying to harass other people. And I don't see that as much in Ethereum. In Ethereum, it's really more about like, how can we support good projects as opposed to putting down projects that we don't like? Um, and I think that's a really important part about building something that's so transformative as, as blockchain technology and whether it's, you know, on the Bitcoin side or any other side um, is, you know, who are you pushing out because the behavior of your community is so negative. 
Um, and we're seeing a lot of just change in culture around the world generally. Like you look at the United States and what's happened with the election and the divisions that are being caused. And I don't wanna see that type of division in our world, in our community. I want to see people that can, you know, happily work on different projects and support each other without getting on Twitter and calling each other assholes every day. Um, good people leave communities like that. And then you end up with what, you know, kind of the community of incels where they just hate on everything and anyone that, that doesn't support them in, in exactly what it is that they're doing. And so for me, I think I would love to see just a consensus um, of the communities that we're in that say, you know, this is not the way we want to treat each other. We want to treat each other with respect. Debate is fine, but respectful debate um, and everything will, will generally improve for, for everyone across the board. Well said. So, so you also said you had two things, right? Was there a second uh, contrarian belief you wanted to share? <laughs> so my second contrarian belief, please don't shoot me for this one, is that um, I think there is a role for banks. I think there is a role mm. for, for institutions, particularly during the transition phase, to mm. getting everyone, you know, off the old system and onto Bitcoin. I think a lot of people just, you know, when they're trying to convince others to use cryptocurrencies, their first thing is invest all your money in this, you know, get rid of everything you're doing, go 100% in Bitcoin. And mm. that's not how people work. There's, there's not enough focus on, you know, strategies that will actually slowly get people on board. Um, you know, uh, it, you can liken it to something like veganism, right? So if you've got a, a meat eating community and you say, go vegan, it's the only way the number of people you're going to change to actually do that is very tiny. But if you say, Hey, like, what about if on Wednesdays you just had a vegetarian meal and then, you know, a year later, okay, what, what if you, you know, try a vegan meal on Tuesdays as well? Like the actual change that you will achieve will be much greater. Many more of those people will move on to become vegans. But if, you know, the same thing with Bitcoin, like a lot of people say, okay, you should be, you should be investing in this. You should be putting everything you own in this. When the reality is the best uh, technique that I know to convince people to get onto Bitcoin is to say, look, invest a dollar, like spend a really interesting evening learning something new, put a dollar in, you don't care if you lose a dollar, it doesn't matter. And like 100% of the people that I talk to about with that mindset will actually go on and do it. And then typically they'll put more money in later. Um, and so I think, so that's sort of the first element is like, what's the narrative that you're using to try to convince people to come on? Um, but then I think the next piece is like, you have to work together with today's system to bridge that gap. You have to work with, you know, what we have today to help people make that transition, both, you know, at the retail consumer level and at the enterprise level. Um, and so I, I think the, the narrative again of, of like break down the banks and that sort of thing is, is maybe um, aspirational, but not realistic in terms of actually achieving the goal of getting, you know, worldwide Bitcoin adoption. Work with the banks. That's your, your, uh, I was going to say uh, an, don't, a bigger. Don't quote it like that though. That sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah. No, well, hey, no, I, I think, I mean, well, yeah, I think it's important to work, work, try and work with them. I mean, you have to because they control the fiat network and the system. So if yeah. people want to get money to you, you have to work. I know it's like, it's like kind of contradictory to say it, but, but I, I, I get, I get what you're saying. Uh, um, Ha, huh. okay, lots. Um, now, in terms of, I guess, that same question, but as it pertains to the world at large, I was going to say, before I even go to that one, um, veganism is probably a contrarian belief within Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true, very true. <laughs> um, I'm not vegan, but I would not go go hunting there for, for my first converse. <laughs> we, I, we, I started like, um we were kind of living in the downtown core for oh my god for almost like 15 years I guess 20 years and so just recently moved out to the burbs and uh, first thing we did was get a barbecue 
Yep. <laughs> <laughs> been barbecuing every day, but but yeah. I eat chick, I eat meat and vegetables, so I, I don't know which yeah. which camp I fall into. I'm um, a big, okay. big meat fan, so I big I meat fan, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My my wife's from Colombia, so yeah, we 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 do the steak thing way nice. too often. <laughs> Um, and that's probably not a, anyways, I will just stop there. Um, but yeah, so, so my, one of my, like, kind of, I, I get a bunch of others kind of tinier questions, but one of my, um, questions that I like asking is the same as the last one, but as it like, you know, you know, what, what's one truth that you hold, but as it pertains to the world at large, um, so outside of, you know, our blockchain, Bitcoin ecosystem, are there things that you kind of look at and you're just like, oh my God, like, like nobody nobody gets this like but why is it and I don't know I mean I, I would by the way I would say one of my biggest ones is the I'll live forever uh thing so we already oh, yeah. touched on that one so let, let's leave that one aside but yeah. just coming from the singularity camp I mean I'd imagine oh, yeah one of my contrarian views I don't know I think one that's maybe not quite as global and maybe more relevant to like the crypto space is I think that sometimes some censorship is a good thing um, I know we see a lot of narrative around, you know, don't, this should be censored and you should be able to say whatever you want, wherever you want. Um, but I think, I think that in order to create a better world, that some censorship is totally acceptable. Um, and that, you know, platforms should have the right to decide what, what they're censoring to a certain degree. And I think obviously there's like, there's a, there's a level and there's, you know, the, the, Contrary to that is, you know, if you're in a country where you have an author, uh, authoritarian, oh my gosh, never pronounce this word, authoritarian government, um, that, you know, what they control, they shouldn't have the same level of control around some of that stuff. But I, I do have concerns about social media and, and what's being said on that and how it, it creates division in society as opposed to cohesion. Um, and I think, mm. you know, this pandemic is such a small challenge in comparison to what's coming. You know, when we look at the changes that climate change are going to bring and the damage that's going to happen and the amount of international cooperation that we're going to need to stop some of this, um, we need to bring people together and not to divide them and not to create, um, you know, conspiracy theories and all these sorts of things. And so I don't, I don't know how you find the happy medium in that, um, where people aren't being harassed online in ways that, you know, can't be stopped. Um, but people are also not being silenced in places where they need to speak out about different things. Um, but I think there needs to be some kind of uh, balance there, I think, to, to really help us create a society that's more prepared to deal with huge challenges like this one um and you know and climate change and and the migration and, and that type of thing that's going to come from it um so that we're better prepared so i don't know if, yeah so, so when i think of censorship right so like for example i just started this whole youtube thing right and now i'm starting to get like some pretty legit comments but i'm not gonna lie there's like your share of people just coming on there shilling like just weird stuff right and obviously i don't want yeah. them anywhere near my uh, so I, i'm deleting their 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 comments because it has nothing to do with anything so I'm for that type of censorship. Like if it's your own private company or domain or something and someone's saying something that you don't believe in and you should be able to censor where things kind of get a little dicey for me is like, like you said, on the government side. So mm -hmm. the question is, is are you advocating for like, you think like, I mean, there's such a like awesome example right now. Like yeah. literally this morning I pulled up Twitter and I see Donald Trump's um, tweets being <laughs> I don't know, like, like not censored, checks. but like, just like, just like all these like blue exclamation points and like, Hey, we're not sure about this one. And <laughs> it's like, that's pretty, that's kind of cool that, that I guess that that happens, but it's also worrisome as like, you know, you heard recently, like the government officials are all coming on. They're like, how dare, you know, Jack, you know, you know, censor us and blah, blah, blah. <sighs> so I guess, I guess my deeper question is, is like, you know, yeah, like governments. So like, where should they be stepping in now? And should they be like, well, no, Twitter is not just a private company. It's a platform that humanity, you know, kind of relies upon and therefore, but like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, where is that? Like, how do you draw that line? It's an interesting question because I think, you know, historically where government was the be all and end all, and that's where the truth came from and et cetera, et cetera. You know, now you could really say that governments don't actually run countries anymore. They run public goods 
but they don't really run countries. That's, you know, tech giants, it's Jeff Bezos, it's Zuckerberg, it's et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so then is there a mandate for government to do more regulation there to say, you know, uh, this is okay, that's not okay because it's based on, you know, an elected uh, system of representation, you know, so it's, it's hypothetically the voice of the people. What I think I would sooner like to see is maybe the voice of the people who use the platform being involved in the decisions around censorship. So you get some kind of democratic system within the platform itself um, where people decide, you know, as a community using this platform, this is what we want or this is not what we want, you know. Um, so, for example, you could say, is there a second set of rules for government people who are tweeting? Are they required to back up every fact that they tweet out with like, the source of where that came from. Um, on the flip side, I'm not sure that really changes anything because the reality is you can take any statistic and make it twist it and move it and make it say exactly and what you want. And find a source. <laughs> and find a source. And, you know, like the, the population isn't educated enough to, you know, disqualify that type of information. Um, and the reality is information doesn't seem to matter anymore to citizens anyway. It's all about stories and, and how do you tell different stories that make people believe or disbelieve in, in certain representations. So um, I don't have a solution to the problem, I think. Um, but I, I think that, ah, goodness, I think we just need to hold our elected officials to a higher standard. I think we need to hold everybody in the world to a higher standard. Um, and I was chatting with Kyle yesterday on, uh, and um, we were talking about it this as well is that it, to me it's super um, weird that I can like the food that you ate yesterday yet if I want to make a decision that impacts where half of my money goes which is the government or whatever 40% where if I want to make a simple like vote on even how something should look in my neighborhood or I should have a checkbox that goes take my money, but just don't bomb children with it. Like, you know, or just something like this. Yeah. Just let me have a little bit of say, uh, why can't, like, why is it that we get to vote once every four years? And it's like this binary outcome where like literally 20% of the population can technically democratically control the other 80%. We have some soul searching to do here. Um, Democracy is fundamentally <laughs> broken. It's yeah. broken. But the question, what is the next system that replaces it? You know, and, and I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that looks like. You know, you could have some kind of direct democracy where you're voting on every issue, but then, you know, you look at some of the people who have the right to vote as they should, but I'm like, I don't want you deciding about where things go. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, yeah, I think, I think True. more yeah. effort, you know, I love what radical exchange is working on um, around, you know, quadratic funding. I'm actually working on one project with the team at Gitcoin that looks at quadratic funding mechanisms, but are like using um, essentially other actions that can support projects or companies that are looking for funding. So tweeting, mm. for example. So if you, you know, share a tweet about one company and you have greater spread of that information through your Twitter followers, like, can you then have a quadratic formula for how much more support that company you're tweeting about gets as a result of that? Um, so there's some interesting, like, interesting modeling around new economic systems and, and new ways of running economies that, you know. Can... Sorry, I'm trying to think of what quadratics are. It just took oh, me back sorry, to like sorry. engineering okay. school. I'm just like, what, no, A so... squared plus B <laughs> squared is the square root of it. She's gonna, I'm gonna look stupid right now. But... <laughs> oh, let, me, let me come back. Okay, so quadratic funding. Think about this. You can do quadratic uh... funding, you can do quadratic voting, but the funding one I find a little bit easier to, to explain. So Quadratic funding, essentially, imagine you've got like a matching program where, you know, there's a platform full of companies that want your funding and there's a big match pool. And so if you donate like $100, it'll get matched $100. Um, so the problem with a system like that is like, so you could even have it in the community. So let's say there's like a community and everyone says, okay, here's 10 projects that people have come up with to make our community better. One is streetlights, one is flowers, one is whatever. Um, someone with like $10,000 could just go in and say, okay, I, I want to fund this one thing. They get all the matching money and their project is, is supported the most because they have the most money. It's just essentially gives a lot of power to people who are rich. Whereas all these people who really like want, like if you had a community where one person wanted flowers and put $10,000 toward it, and you had 10,000 other people that wanted a new bridge across a river 
but only had a dollar each, then that shouldn't match, you know? And so quadratic funding essentially is a funding mechanism where your project receives a higher proportion of the funding money um, based on the volume of people that support it as opposed to the financial mm. contribution. Okay, yeah. cool. And so the same thing can be applied to voting where like if you have, mm. uh, let's say it's the same situation, you've got 10 projects, you have 10 votes, you can vote like, you know, yes or no on one of them. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't take into account the fact that you may care like so much about one of these projects and not care at all about mm -hmm. the other nine, but you can still only allocate one vote to that project you really care about. In a quadratic system, mm. you could put all 10 of your votes on that one project and vote not at all for any of the others. Um, but what's really cool is that, so let's say you have one vote, um, it would cost you like, yeah, so if you wanna put one ballot in, it costs you one of your votes. But if you wanna put two ballots in, it costs you four of your votes and three, nine of your votes. And it goes up quadratically so that you can't kind of stuff the ballot box. So it costs you more and more and more money if you wanna put more ballots in a particular box. And so again, it comes back to like situations where, um, you know, yeah, like you wanna support something and you have a lot of, a lot of power, um, it reduces that power quadratically and gives more of that power to, to all the individuals in the community. A little bit off off topic, but but I was gonna say, did you hear? Do you, you know who Sam is, the FTX guy? I've heard of him, but I don't know much about him. I don't know if it's true or not, but I just saw this morning that he had donated he the second yes. highest donated yes. to Biden's uh, to Biden's case. So this yeah. like or Biden's literally uh, run, comes yeah. back to the book that I wrote on cryptocurrency donations, and when you look at like the political scene. Uh, charities aside, who are already not taking advantage of this, but the political potential for crypto donors to have impact if all of their representatives started taking crypto donations would be absolutely monumental, right? I mean, like, that's huge. This guy kind of came out of nowhere, according to traditional media and traditional circles, and, and was able to drop this huge amount of money on that campaign. Um, but then again, again, you know, it's like how much power should one guy with $5.2 million have versus you know, an entire community, 5.2 million people that only have a dollar, should they have more say than this one man? And that's kind of the background of quadratic funding and quadratic voting. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Uh, yeah, I find a lot of this stuff interesting. I just, uh, it's just, there's just so many hours in a day, you know, it's so hard to like just uh, do everything. But, but fascinating. I do think blockchain is fundamentally going to not just change money, even though I do think that is the that should be where the focus is because, mm -hmm. because, because uh, I mean, the, the, the thing that I want to see come about is like a free market, like a real free yeah. market. Mm -hmm. And to me, to get that, you need to solve money and money yeah. is one half of every transaction. And therefore I like the fact that there are these like gladiator type people <laughs> that run Bitcoin that are super <laughs> mean. And, you know, they're just like, ah, oh, it's going to happen no matter what. You know, but then Ethereum is, is if you think about it, it's fitting, right? Because they're a little bit more like diversity and like break and move, what is it? Move fast, break things and, yeah. you know, dressed up like unicorns on stage and like weird, funny things. Like, I think, I think, you know what, at the end of the day, yeah, people should get to choose what they want to do. It's like, uh, and you know, the, I'm sure Ethereum fits like a, I mean, it does fit a, a very important need um, in terms of experimentation and new ideas. And if you look at a lot of the, you know, innovation outside of just money, I would say that, you know, Ethereum's kind of taken the, the lion's share of a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. So I think you've got through my my American gladiator, like my four crazy questions. So I got a couple of um, kind of follow up things that I was thinking about while you were talking. So Ubi, um, what, so, you, so you've seen this like singular, you're, you're kind of bought into this singularity thing. Okay, so like AI is emerging. It's like, you don't need to be sold on this notion that like something is coming down the line here that will fundamentally change um, humanity. Um, so where does Ubi, first of all, do you, what, what's your thought on it? Are you like pro, con, in between somewhere? I think it's really interesting. I like, I would love to, I was really sad fundamentally when the trial in Ontario of it um, got canceled. I think more than anything, the world needs information. They need research on what are the outcomes of this? Like that, had they actually pushed that forward? 
um, we could have seen what the outcome was. But in a way, what we're experiencing right now with the pandemic and the government transfers is a bit of a proxy for that in a way. You know, there's certainly restrictions around what people could do and, and you know, what they might be spending it on. Um, what I would really love to see, and I haven't seen, and it's probably out there somewhere, is really just a calculation of where is the money going to come from? Um, because I, I haven't seen that. I, I love the idea that, you know, people's basic needs will always be taken care of, you know, th that food, shelter, water, and from there, it's, it's up to you. And, and if you kind of can't organize yourself to get food, shelter, water on that level, then I think that's sort of where the individual responsibility comes in. Um, the question again is, yeah, where, where does the money come from? Show um, me the money. Show me the money. And I, I really, um, I don't love the idea of, you know, taxing the upper bracket 70% or something like that. I just, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Agreed. I've mm -hmm. seen the work and the risk that comes with starting your own business. And then to see the people who are successful at it have like their life savings eaten away. Um, I, I don't think is okay. I, I really don't. Um, and so for me, it needs to, it, that's a really big question is when jobs start to disappear. Uh, you know, fundamentally, I think the taxation system just needs to change completely. We need a 10 X redesign on how governments collect money and then what they're doing with it. And that for me is a really big one. I think, um, I've seen a lot of how government works through friends and family that, that work in, in that space. And I'm unimpressed with, with what they're up to. I'm unimpressed with more than anything, not the, not the actions, but the process and, and the inefficiencies and the bureaucracy and, you know, the amount of money and time that gets put into propping up, you know, employees that don't do a whole lot. And there are some great people that work in government. There's some great programs that come out of it. Um, but I heard a stat that, uh, you know, I think there's like a hundred thousand federal employees or something. Don't quote me on the stat, but basically that they had fired seven people in an entire year with the entire federal government. And so I just don't see that being an effective way of actually, you know, operating a system that has so much money. So hundred percent agree with you on that. I, I believe, I love the, the overall idea of giving every human on earth some sort of, you know, basic living income so that they don't have to, like, I mean, I look, I'm all for like entrepreneurialism and working hard and making lots of money, but I've also seen enough of the world to know that like, all you need to do is get like $10 in the hands of like everyone on earth. And you've, you know, doubled like half the people on earth's income. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I do not like the idea, like philosophically speaking, even of taking money. And, and to me, inflation and taxation and all of that is like taking money. Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of using those, you know, levers, if you will, to, 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 to support this vision. I do sometimes, and this is more just like a kind of a, like a random kind of idea or thing that I've been thinking about and it might just be like an idea that looks like really stupid but I've been thinking like if you look at like okay again AI you look at automation um, you look at that the main food for AI is data mm -hmm. and you realize that data mostly sits behind the walls of like five maybe seven companies and two governments like most of all this data okay so you've got like seven to ten entities like nodes if you will that control all of the food for this, this, you know, this, this intelligent thing that's about to like be birthed. Um, to me, that's scary. And, uh, and so I sometimes wonder is like, I wonder if, if a completely parallel system could be built, something that's more analogous to like Bitcoin, um, that could somehow systematically take the profits generated from automation and feed that back into some sort of Ubi program. There'd still be obviously like the incentive for people to build businesses and all that. But I wonder if like you could, again, build cell phones, computers, um, robots, everything drones from like ground up in an open source way, in a decentralized way, where again, the robots themselves, uh, maybe 1% of everything that they earned from doing whatever they do somehow systematically get fed back into an Ubi program. Um, yeah. The closest thing that I've seen to this is something called Good Dollar by the founder of eToro. 
Oh, yeah. Um, Yanni Asai is like, I think one of the smartest people out there. He, he, his name is on the colored coins, white paper. He's been in Bitcoin longer than anybody I know. Um, and he is working on, he spoke at the OECD, um, last year as like the keynote speaker. So this is something that's not like, oh, cute. And like, there's a nice white paper. It's like, you know, the top governments of the world are, are going, Hey, look, this guy might be onto something anyway. So maybe I'll just stop there. Yeah, bit preachy, I, I, but love, I, I love that you know, stuff. I, mm-hmm. I think that idea is really interesting. I think on, as an alternative, as opposed to, you know, taxing money or getting money from robots or whatever, and giving it out, you can also achieve the same outcome by driving the cost of things down. And so when you look at energy costs, for example, and how they're very high for people in Canadian winter who have to pay to heat their houses. Well, if if you're running solar and you drive the cost of energy down as close to zero as possible, that cost disappears. You know, if you can build a house with 3D printers, as opposed to with, you know, a team of construction workers, the cost of housing goes fairly close to zero. Um, And so you can kind of actually achieve the same outcome without having to take money from people in the same way um, by investing in these exponential type technologies uh, that will will actually help create this abundance of of everything for everyone. So if Raymond wants to hop on board with, uh, you know, this project you and I are crafting up here, we'll uh, we'll think about it. We'll put him through the interview process. Yeah, we'll we'll think about it. (laughs) Um, We've got a lot of candidates, you know, it's a a tough, tough space. Yeah. Uh, Okay. And this has been delightful. Um, Were there, was was there a, a, a question that you wish I had asked that maybe I didn't? That's one of my final uh, questions. I mean, most of the closing questions in, in Bitcoin interviews are like, where do you think it's going to be in five years? Like that type of thing. I, what I want to know from you, I'm going to ask you this question and you can answer it. Mm -hmm. Um, Where do you think the blockchain industry is going to go wrong in the next five years and how can we stop it or fix it? Oh, you're turning the mic on me. Mm -hmm. Where do I think we could go wrong? Hmm. I think the thing that I've seen over and over again, where most people go wrong is they, um, they come from a place of like, what's in it for me instead of like, how can I serve? And in the Bitcoin space, there's enough um, obfuscation. There's enough uh, technical mumbo jumbo that we can hide behind to screw people. Mm. And I've seen it happen with the ICO space. That's why I was pretty like outspoken about, you know, putting guys like Tone Vase on stage, if you remember at my events. Um, I'm not against people fundraising, but I'm afraid of like false promises and white papers that that people are, and, and human hum, humans just generally have this desire to, you know, want to get the next Bitcoin. What's the next Bitcoin? Oh, well, it's this thing that came out last week and, no, like Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin to some extent. And so I worry about, yeah, just people getting fleeced. And that's partially why I'm doing these, these like daily two hour, one hour long, like exposes on, you know, on at least what I think and getting my, my feelings out there, you know? Um, yeah. So I think that's where, where we could go wrong again is, is people just trying to screw people and, and what ends up happening, you know, and that comes in the form of different flavors, like exchanges going, we're just going to list the cheapest coin because, you know, yeah, Indian people pay love cheap coins, do- you know, or yeah. something like that. And it's like, wait, but like, what are we doing here exactly? Are we building casinos? Are we trying to build like a gateway into the future here? Or what are we, what are we trying to do here? So I find like the free market can be a bit, um, yeah, selfish, you know, and I know it's a function of it, but I feel like actions taken along those lines instigate regulators to, to come and, you know, throw the hammer down and it, regulators won't have the time or the money or the energy to, sift through like oh well bitcoin is different from this new you know shit coin and and so so that so that all of it gets squashed and humanity gets pushed back so that's my my biggest you know one of my biggest concerns Mm -hmm. nice and you i like it yeah that's a big one um i i i would hate to see if there were some kind of like I think one of the pieces around on some of the technologies is, is there's this so much FOMO and so much hype and like get it out fast and get it out quick and get all these people on board. And when you're building such um, a base layer of society, I think slower is better. I think making sure it works 100% before it goes out to, you know, particularly ordinary audiences is really important. 
And so I think a lot of the pressure that we put on some of these uh, communities and, and projects to, to um, produce as fast as possible is actually a real negative. I think we need to take our time, make sure it's perfect um, because you get one big hack, one big breakdown, one big something, and it could all be over. Um, and, you know, b building technology is easy. Building confidence in a community is actually really difficult. And so I, I want to make sure that, you know, we, we do it right. We do it right the first time. Do you want to answer that question around where do you see Bitcoin in five years? Like to me, the reason I don't answer that is because it's more a function of like what we do. Yeah, I don't, you know, what I, mean? you know I don't care. Like, I don't where the see prices. it as some like, yeah, I, exactly. like I know people that have <laughs> like too. price alerts on their watches and I'm like, I don't care. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, like I bought in. It's the least interesting it's thing. It's literally the least interesting blockchain. thing. Like I, I, yeah. I bought in at the beginning and I put in, you know, exactly what I was willing to lose. And then it dropped by half and I had a panic attack and then. I realized, no, no, I'm in this for the long run. Don't sell, don't freak out. This is fine. And of course, like things have worked out just fine. Um, but yeah, the prices, it's irrelevant. For me, it's who's using it. Like when I see new exchanges pop up in Africa, for me, that's a huge win. When I see, you know, um, really uh, like blue check people on Twitter who are now accepting crypto for their products and services, like for me, that's a mm. huge win because you know, I mean, it's like that famous meme where it's like, oh, are you saying when Bitcoin hits a million dollars or when Bitcoin goes up, I can sell it for a million dollars. It's like, well, no, when it when it goes up, you won't have to sell it. You can just use it. And that's really mm. the goal is, is, you know, you get to a point where you've invested in something that has changed the world, um, both with your money and most importantly, with your time and, and your mental energy. Well, that seems like a great place to, to, you know, at least start bringing it to a close. I was going to say, where can people, I don't know, learn more about the book, about yeah. you, about Twitter, LinkedIn, all that kind of, I don't know. Yeah, where, yeah. Twitter, I'm at Ann underscore Connolly. Um, check out our graphic novel at trustgraphicnovel.com. Um, and, you know, we're always interested in support. We're looking at turning it into a full animated motion comic. And there's a little teaser on YouTube that you can find on our website as well. So I actively encourage you to take a look. It's pretty, pretty great. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, any last words or should we bring this to a close? That's it. I love All it. All right. Thanks perfect. For having me.